What's going on guys? Evan Preco here. You are watching SG1 Sports Big Ten Football Channel. In this game we've got our week 13 recap. And to start things off, we got the big game in the Big Ten this week. Number 8 Penn State at number 2 Ohio State. Uh, this game didn't have as much hype going into it as it did earlier in the season because of Penn State's loss to Minnesota. And um, the final score of this game, Ohio State ended up beating Penn State 28-17. to It was pretty much... Uh, it was pretty much all Ohio State's way for most of the game. Um, or in the third quarter, it was all. It seemed like it was a lot of Penn State. They almost came back to tie the game. Um, but yeah, so in the first quarter, Ohio State scored on a J.K. Dobbins touchdown run to make it seven nothing. Second quarter, J.K. Dobbins would score again on fourth and goal to make it fourteen nothing. That'd be the score at halftime. And then on their opening drive of the second half, they would score again to make it twenty one nothing on a K.J. Hill touchdown catch and then journey brown for penn state would score a touchdown and make it 21 to 7 after a fumble they would uh capitalize and will levis the backup quarterback would score a one yard touchdown run to make it 21 to 14 and after another fumble uh penn state would tack on a field goal to make it 21 17 but then ohio state in the fourth quarter would prevail and they would score again and t and take the ball away um on an interception and they would end up winning the game 28 to 17 for the stats justin fields went 16 of 22 for 188 yards, two touchdown passes. J.K. Dobbins was their leading rusher, 36 carries, 157 yards, averaging 4.5 yards a carry and two touchdowns. And K.J. Hill had four receptions for 46 yards, averaging 11.5 yards a catch and a touchdown. He was their leading receiver. Chris Olave was right behind him with two receptions for 44 yards, averaging 22 yards per catch exactly, and a touchdown. Ohio State ran for 229 yards, and they had 417 total yards of offense. They did fumble the ball three times, and those were their three turnovers of the game, so they do have a little bit of ball control to work on this week in preparation for Michigan. For Penn State, Sean Clifford started. He went 10 of 17 for only 71 yards. He got hurt in the first half, so Will Levis, his backup, came in. He, Passing-wise, he went 6 for 11 for 57 yards and a pick. Rushing-wise, he had 18 carries for 34 yards, averaging just under 2 yards a carry and a touchdown run on the quarterback sneak. Journey Brown was their leading rusher, however. He had 11 carries for 64 yards, averaging f almost 6 yards a carry and a touchdown run. K.J. Hamler was their leading receiver. He had 3 receptions for 45 yards, averaging 15 yards a catch. Penn State ran the ball for only 99 yards, and they had only 227 total yards of offense, and they turned the ball once on an interception. I thought this game would be better than it went. Uh, I did not expect Ohio State to dominate in the first half. Now, yes, I do understand how good Ohio State is, but I still thought that, you know, at the time I thought Penn State was one of the best teams in the Big Ten as well, and that they would make it a game, and they did in the third quarter. They did make it a game. They were forcing turnovers, and they were scoring off, scoring points off of them. But, yeah, I mean, this game had a lot of hype during the season, but then after Penn State lost to Minnesota, the hype kind of went away. People were still looking forward to it, but it was not, we knew that it wasn't going to be the <clears throat> the big game of the year that everybody thought it would be earlier in the season. Well, this is a huge win for Ohio State. They're going to the Big Ten Championship now. Um, that's what we thought would happen from the start, but now it's officially confirmed. So Penn State um, you know, falls to two losses on the season, both of them conference losses, and they will not be playing for a uh, Big Ten Championship. So it's going to be Ohio State and then either Minnesota or Wisconsin, whoever wins that game. So this is a big win for Ohio State. Um, they're going to the third. They're going to the Big Ten championship game for their third straight year, and, uh, and will have a chance to win their third straight Big Ten title. And um, if they win that game, they will go to the playoff. So, but first they got to beat Michigan um, to possibly have the playoff spot. They can they can lose to Michigan and still win the East. But if they lose to Michigan, they might fall out of the top four. I doubt it, but uh, to be on the safer side, Ohio State needs to beat Michigan and then win the Big Ten Championship just to confirm their playoff spot. I still think Penn State's a good team. I don't know where they're going to fall in the rankings, but um, we'll see what ends up happening for them. Um, they might drop to 10 or 11 or something like that, but I think they could still make um, a case for you know possibly the Rose Bowl. They could maybe go to the Orange Bowl or the Citrus Bowl. Um, so we'll see what happens with them. But yeah, this was, uh, overall, it wasn't that exciting of a game to watch, but it did get exciting at times through the third quarter. Um, but yeah, no, big, big game in the Big Ten, and we'll see what happens for each team's next week.
Next up, we've got number 10, Minnesota at Northwestern. The final score of this game, Minnesota beat Northwestern pretty handedly, 38-22. to And the way this game went, um, it was all Minnesota from the start. They scored two touchdowns in the first quarter to make it 14-0. And then the second quarter, they scored again at the beginning to make it 21-0. And uh, Joe Gaziano for Northwestern would force a safety to make it 21-2. And they would capitalize on that safety by scoring a touchdown, Jace James, um, would catch a touchdown from Andrew Marty to make it 21 to nine, but then and that'd be the score at halftime. But then in the second half, Minnesota would score again to make it 28 to nine. Northwestern would answer to make it 28 to 16. They'd score another touchdown. Minnesota would add on a touchdown and a field goal to take 10 more points, make it 38 to 16. And then with about two minutes left in the game, a garbage time touchdown, um, and they did not. They went for two and they were not able to get it. So the final score of this game, 38 to 22. And uh, for the stats for the Minnesota Gophers, uh, Tanner Morgan went 15 of 23 for 211 yards, four touchdown passes, one interception. Rodney Smith was again their leading rusher, 15 carries, 77 yards, averaging just over five yards a carry. Tyler Johnson had a great day. He went off. He was their leading receiver, seven receptions, 125 yards, averaging just under 18 yards a catch, one touchdown. And Rashad Bateman had a great game as well. He had seven receptions for 78 yards, averaging just over 11 yards a catch, and three touchdown catches. Minnesota ran for 212 yards. They had 423 total yards of offense, one turnover. For the Northwestern Wildcats, Hunter Johnson started, but he ended up getting hurt early in the first half, so Andrew Marty came in. He went 8 of 10 for 95 yards and a touchdown pass. Rushing-wise, he had 16 carries for 52 yards, Averaging 3.3 yards a carry and two touchdowns. He was also he was their leading rusher as well. Riley Lease was their leading receiver. He had three receptions for 53 yards, averaging 17.7 yards a catch. Uh, Northwestern ran for 128 yards, but they did only have 223 total yards of offense. Now, this is good for Minnesota. Um, we all knew they were going to win this game. and I Northwestern played better than I thought they would. I did not expect them to score uh, 22 points on Minnesota, but, um, you know, they, they played well. And the Gophers, they played very well as well, and this is a big win for them, um, especially coming off of the loss to Iowa last week. This is a good uh, confidence booster going into right what is right now your biggest game of the year and rivalry weekend. So, you know, after the loss to Minnesota, it, in my opinion, it doesn't matter who you beat this week. They could have beaten Rutgers, and it would have been still really positive for them. The best thing for them is to have confidence, have their heads up high going into this game because you don't want their heads low thinking about that Iowa game going into this game. You want them to be positive, be confident when they play Wisconsin, and this win, is it's going to do that for them. And I think that they're going to be going in with a ton of motivation for Minnesota. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what ends up happening next week for Paul Bunyan's Axe. Um, for Northwestern, they fall to 2-9 and nine on the season, and another loss has just been a miserable season for them. Even though, you know, they were able to make some plays. It was a blowout for most of the game, and a lot of their points were scored in garbage time. But, I mean, hey, they were able to make some plays. They were able to do some positive things on the field, and, you know, they ended with a touchdown with two minutes left. So they left the game um, having made a positive play, even though it didn't really change much on the scoreboard. Um, so yeah, another disappointing win for them. They're still winless in conference play, um, and we'll see what ends up happening for them. So yeah, a good win for Minnesota. I'm very much looking forward to see how they do next week against the Wisconsin Badgers for Northwestern. They're going to play Illinois next week, and Illinois, um, you know, they've had they're having a pretty good season right now. So we'll see what ends up happening with them. But yeah, good win for Minnesota. We'll see what ends up happening next week for them. Next up, we've got Illinois at number 17, Iowa. And the final score of this game, Iowa beats Illinois and ends their four-game winning streak. Uh, pretty low-scoring game, 19-10. to And the way the game went, Tyler Goodson scored a touchdown run early in the first quarter, make it 7-0. And then Danny Navarro would catch a touchdown pass to nod it up at 7 for Illinois. And in the second quarter, um, Iowa would kick two field goals, one of them being right at the end of the half to score six points so this score at halftime would be 13 to 7 and then nothing happened in the third quarter scoring wise in the fourth quarter Iowa would tag on another field goal to make it 16 to 7 Illinois would kick a field goal to make it 16 to 10 and then Iowa would kick one more field goal just under three minutes to go to make a 19 to 10 and pretty much seal up this game and for the stats 
For Iowa, Nate Stanley went 18 of 35 for 308 yards and an interception. Tyler Goodson was their leading rusher, 21 carries, only 38 yards. They didn't run that ball that much. That, they did not run the ball that much on Saturday. Uh, he's average. He's averaging just under two yards a carry. He did have a touchdown run. Amir Smith Marset was their leading receiver, four receptions for 121 yards, averaging just over 30 yards a catch. Uh, he had 79 total rushing yards, and they had 387 total yards of offense, one turnover. For Illinois, Brandon Peters was their leading passer, 16 of 31 for 125 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. He was also their leading rusher, 10 carries for 76 yards, averaging 7.6 yards a carry. Donnie Navarro was their leading receiver, three receptions for 36 yards, averaging 12 yards a catch exactly, and a touchdown. Illinois ran for 192 yards and had 336 total yards of offense. They turned the ball over three times, however. Um, for Illinois, this ends their four-game winning streak. The first loss they've suffered since Michigan, so now they are 6-5. and five. Um, The good thing is they're still going to go to a bowl game, and next week they're going to play Northwestern, and they should be able to win that game. So I'm believing they'll end the season 7-5, and five, which will give them a... a a decent bowl bid. Um, they're not going to go to anything special, and I can't think of a bowl, a specific bowl game that they'd go off, off to off the top of my head. It'll be a small one, but not like not one of those little, little, little ones that you've never heard of before. It'll be a small one that people know about, I believe. Um, for Iowa, another good win for them, another conference win. They go to eight and three on the season. Next week they play Nebraska on Black Friday, so we'll see what ends up happening for them. They're sitting at eight and three. They could finally win nine games and go nine and three. Um, or they could fall to 8-4, and four, but I think that they're going to make a case for probably the Holiday Bowl or the Outback Bowl or Capital One Bowl or something like that. So we'll see what ends up happening with them. But yeah, this is a pretty entertaining game to watch. It was pretty close for the most part. Um, it only became kind of a, you know, I don't want to say, it was not a blowout in any way, but it only became, you know, a decent big lead for Iowa right at the end of the game when they took the nine-point lead off the field goal. But yeah, it was a pretty good game to watch. A nice, good, low-scoring defensive game to watch, which is classic Big Ten in my opinion. And we'll see what ends up happening with both of these teams in the coming weeks. Next up, we've got Michigan State at Rutgers. And the final score of this game, all Michigan State. They beat Rutgers 27 to nothing, And this was pretty much all Michigan State the entire way through. And we knew it at halftime. The score was 17 to nothing, so we knew this was going to be a win for them early, and then they'd score 10 more points in the second half to make it 27 to nothing. Um, for Michigan State, Brian Lewerke, he went 21 of 30 for 239 yards, three touchdown passes, one interception. Elijah Collins was their leading rusher, 31 carries for 109 yards, averaging 3.5 yards a carry. Cody White had himself a day. He was their leading receiver, 11 receptions, 136 yards, averaging 12.5 yards a catch, three touchdown catches. Michigan State ran for 156 yards, and they had 395 total yards of offense, one turnover. For Rutgers, Johnny Langan, had, was, he went 8 of 20 for 57 yards only, one interception. He was also their leading rusher. He had 14 carries for 49 yards, averaging 3.5 yards a carry. Isaiah Pacheco was their leading receiver. He had two receptions for 25 yards, averaging 12.5 yards a catch. Rutgers ran for only 83 yards, and they had only 140 yards of offense, and they turned the ball over twice. Well, after Michigan State's big blowout loss last week to the Wolverines, um, you know, they're four and six. They were barely holding on by a thread for bowl eligibility. They are very, very fortunate that their last two games of the season are against two of the Big Ten's three weakest teams. They just beat Rutgers. Next week, they're going to be finishing against Maryland. Um, and like I said last week, I expected them to win this game. I, I also expect them to win next week's game, so I believe that they will go six and six and have a bowl bid. Um, as far as this game went, you know, defensively, they played very well. They held Rutgers scoreless, barely gave up any yards and forced a couple turnovers. Offensively, I thought they would play a lot better. Um, we all know about Michigan State's offensive struggles throughout the entire season. But, I mean, only 27 points. They only scored 10 points in the second half. And uh, they only scored three points in the third quarter alone. They had only a field goal. So, you know, they, they have a lot of stuff to work on on offense. But with the way the season's winding down, you know, how much are you going to be able to do in, the, in, the, in two more games that you're probably going to be playing? They've got Maryland, and then they've got whoever they play in whatever bowl game they make, if they beat Maryland, which they should. Uh, but once again, very fortunate that they, are, they have an easy end of the season uh, for them, considering the chaos that was going on in East Lansing 
over the past few weeks to their loss to Michigan State and their to their loss to Michigan, excuse me, and their lo- comeback loss to Illinois the week before when they blew the big lead. Uh, but yeah, it's a good win for them. Uh, blowout, a shutout, good way to keep their heads up high, and we'll see what they end up doing next week. If they win next week, they should make a bowl bid, and we'll see who they end up playing in their bowl game and what bowl game they end up making. Not much to talk about with this one. Um, you know, two one, one, one team that's struggling a little bit and one majorly struggling team and a blowout victory for the better team. This one for Rutgers, they're going to be playing Penn State, I believe. Um, yep, they're going to be playing Penn State uh, to finish out the season. They're still winless in conference play, and I expect them to finish the season winless at a 2 in conference play at 0-8, and 0-9, and, and they're going to finish the season at 2-10 and 10 because I don't think they stand a chance against the Nittany Lions. So we'll see what ends up happening with both teams. Um, for Rutgers, they're probably going to lose. For Michigan State, we'll see what ends up happening against Maryland, and if they win, we'll see what ends up happening in the bowl game that they end up going to. How about number 13, Michigan at Indiana? The final score of this game, Michigan blows out Indiana 39-14. to And the way this game went, it was pretty back and forth early in the first half. Indiana scored on their opening drive to make it 7 nothing, and Michigan would answer to make it 7-7 at the end of one. And in the second quarter, Peyton Ramsey would score a touchdown early to make it 14-7. And then uh, Michigan would score two straight touchdowns to make it 21-14 Michigan. That would be the score at halftime. In the second half, it was all Michigan. They would tag on a field goal and score two more touchdowns, all happening in the third quarter. Nothing happened in the fourth quarter. So the final score of the game, 39-14. to For the Wolverines, Shea Patterson went 20-32 of for 366 yards, five touchdown passes, one interception. Zach Charbonnet was their leading rusher. He had eight carries for only 46 yards, averaging 5.8 yards a carry. Nico Collins was their leading receiver. He had six receptions for 165 yards averaging 27.5 yards per catch, and three touchdown catches. He was balling out on Saturday. Uh, Michigan ran the ball for only 87 yards, but they did have a total of 453 yards on offense. They turned the ball over once on Patterson's interception. For Indiana, Peyton Ramsey went 17 of 29 for 217 yards and a pick. Stevie Scott the third was their leading rusher. He had 13 carries for 54 yards, averaging just over four yards a carry. One touchdown. Peyton Hendershot was their leading receiver. He had six receptions for 62 yards, averaging 10.3 yards a catch. Indiana ran the ball for only 97 yards, and they did have 321 total yards of offense. They turned the ball twice. They turned the ball over twice, however. So, big win. This is a big, big win for Michigan. I know Indiana was unranked and everything, but they had looked really good in the past few weeks. Their offense was scoring, like, what, 31 points a game, averaging something like that. And then they had... They, 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 they had lost to Penn State the week before, but they had played very well against Penn State, and they had made it a close game for most of the game. So for Michigan to go on the road to Indiana, a game that was receiving quite a bit of hype throughout the week, and absolutely, I don't want to say obliterate them, but beat them handedly, just looks huge for them. It does. It really does. They're playing really well right now. And, I mean, even though Michigan lost to Penn State earlier in the season, I'm going to say now, with the way that both teams have been playing so far over the past few weeks, I think if Michigan and Penn State were to face each other again for some reason, it's not going to happen, but let's say they did for some reason, I, I'm a true believer Michigan would beat them. Um, they're playing so well right now. They're playing really well, and it's the perfect time for them to play Ohio State now because here's when they're really, really going to get tested now. They've beaten some good teams. They've blown out some teams, and they've beaten some good teams on the road. So we'll see what ends up happening next week in the game. They're lucky enough that they get the Buckeyes up in Ann Arbor, so it'll be a huge crowd for that game in uh, Michigan Stadium in the big house, and there's going to be a lot of hype leading up to it. So we'll see what ends up happening with Michigan. I'm going to go ahead and say Ohio State still wins this game just based on how great they've been playing overall over the the entire the course of the entire season um but hey Michigan Michigan's playing well they are they're playing really really well right now so i think that even though Ohio State wins this game i think they could make it a game i think Michigan could make it a game and i'm not going to say Michigan's going to win this game Ohio State's going to win this game in my opinion but this could be a possible upset of the season it really could. And it's not going to make that big of an impact on the Big Ten East because Ohio State's won it, and that's going to be that. And I think they're going to make the playoff regardless. But if Michigan win, Michigan could pull off a possible upset. It would, it would be one of the you know upsets of the year, 
Michigan's first win since 2011 against Ohio State. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but all I'm saying is that I'm not going to be totally 100% surprised if it does. I think that it is a possibility, but I think that it's a greater possibility that Ohio State wins this game. I'm predicting an Ohio State win, but it's going to be a good game. It's not going to be a blowout because Michigan is playing well. They have loads of confidence right now because of the games that they've played. And, yeah, it, it's it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a tough battle, but it's going to be a fun one uh, for both teams. For Indiana, they fall to 7-4. and four. Um, It's a disappointing look for them because of how well they've played the past few weeks. But they're going to finish the season against Purdue. So we'll see what happens with them. And Purdue is no longer bowl eligible. So we'll see if Indiana can win that last game, go eight and four, and you know make a possible decent bowl, or if they fall to seven and five and they'll go to a smaller bowl. But a pretty positive season for them overall, because the past few years they had just been short of making a bowl game. So we'll see what ends up happening with them next week against the Boilermakers. It's going to be in West Lafayette, and um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to see what happens with Michigan and Indiana in uh, the coming few weeks. We haven't seen Indiana in a bowl game in a while, so it'll be fun to see how they perform in theirs and who they play and where they go. And I'm very much looking forward to the Ohio State-Michigan game. And we'll see how well Michigan plays against Ohio State, and we'll see if they could possibly beat them. I don't know, but we'll see what ends up happening in the biggest game of the Big Ten year. Next up, we've got Nebraska at Maryland. Nebraska, another one of those four and six teams that are barely holding on by a thread to make a bowl game. And they blew out Maryland in this game 54-7. to It was all Nebraska from the start. They were playing very well on offense, very well on defense. And this looked like a brand new football team to me this week from the football team that we had seen in the four weeks prior. Um, so the way the stats went, uh, Adrian Martinez went 16 of 25, for 194 yards, two touchdown passes, and an interception. He was also their leading rusher. He had 10 carries for 94 yards, averaging 9.4 yards a carry, and a touchdown run. J.D. Spielman was their leading receiver. He had seven receptions for 104 yards, averaging just under 15 yards a catch, and two touchdown catches, one of them being an amazing acrobatic catch that bounced off of a defender or two. Um, Nebraska ran the ball for 305 yards and had 531 total yards of offense, uh, one turnover on the Martinez interception. For Maryland, all four quarterbacks for Maryland played in this game, um, but Josh Jackson got the start. He went 4 of 12 for only 33 yards. Javon Leak was their leading rusher. He had eight carries for 80 yards, averaging 10 yards a carry and a touchdown run. Dante Demas Jr. and Brian Cobbs both tied for leading uh, for the leading receiver. They each had one reception for 12 yards. Maryland ran the ball for 149 yards, and they only had 206 total yards of offense. They turned the ball over four times, all of them on fumbles. Now, I'm not going to say, oh my goodness, this Nebraska team is all of a sudden really good. They played extremely well, um, but at the same time, you got to realize who they're playing. They're playing Maryland. Now, Nebraska went into this game six and a half point favorites over Maryland, so I am still surprised that they played as well as they did. They must have had a great week of practice after the Wisconsin loss. And I mentioned this in the last video last week. Their loss against Wisconsin, the way they played offensively, there were a lot of good things to take out of that game for Nebraska, even though they lost that game, um, that they ended up bringing into this game. And it they exposed Maryland and all their weaknesses, and they Nebraska played to their maximum strength on offense and on defense. They were... They did not give up a lot of yards on defense. They were forcing fumbles. They were forcing turnovers... And a lot of it has to do with probably a wet ball because it was rainy during the game. But then, you know, their offense, they moved the ball tremendously. Their running game was fantastic. Their passing game was very good. Um, and they got the third, they got the second and third string in there too. We saw Luke McCaffrey, their uh, big recruit quarterback. He came in. Um, he ran the ball pretty well and threw the ball pretty well. And he also had a couple receptions too. He played a little bit of wide receiver because they're a little thin at that spot right now. But yeah, this is a fantastic win for Nebraska. They now move to 5-6, and six, and next week they're going to be playing Iowa on Black Friday. And if they win that game, they will make a bowl game. This has been a rivalry that has been dominated by Iowa over the past four years. So we'll see if Nebraska can finally win one for the first time since 2014 against them. It's lucky enough the game will be down in Lincoln, Nebraska, so um, Nebraska will have the home field advantage for uh, that game, and we'll end up seeing what happens with uh, Nebraska. If they can win that game, then they'll probably go to a bowl game. And if they do go to a bowl game, we'll see which bowl game they go to, where they go, 
who they play, and how they play. As for Maryland, this is kind of the icing on the cake for how their season's going so far. Um, I believe that they would lose this game, but to lose by 47 points, to lose by 47 points at home against a team that was 4-6 and six is just downright humiliating in my opinion. And, I mean, it... it I don't know how you address the team after a loss like this. I don't know if you just try to forget about it, get it out of their heads, and go back to the drawing board and figure something out before they play Michigan State next week in East Lansing. But, oh my goodness, they they look flat out bad. Um, their running game was all right, except for the fumbles. They got a lot of rushing yards, but I don't want to say a lot of rushing yards. They had, um, what was it again? They had... 149 total rushing yards. So not a lot, but um, Javon Leak, he, he played all right for with the amount of carries he was given. He did fumble the ball a lot, but that can be given to, you know, the whole it was raining and the ball was wet and slippery. So um, the running game was okay. Their passing game was very weak. And, you know, they played four different quarterbacks. So that's not really surprising. But... I just did not expect this to be as humiliating of a game for them as it was. I didn't think they'd win it, but I did not expect them to look that bad in it to a team that was 4-6. and six. But yeah, as far as Nebraska goes, we'll see what ends up happening with them on Black Friday against Iowa. And if they win that game, we'll see what ends up happening um, with their bowl bid. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good game to watch, in my opinion, against Iowa. And we'll see what ends up happening with, to them within the coming weeks. The last game we've got for the video, we've got Purdue at number 12, Wisconsin. The final score of this game, Wisconsin won pretty handedly 45-24 to the way this game went. It was pretty back and forth throughout the most or the entire first half. Wisconsin scored first on their opening drive on an Aaron Crookshank 27-yard run out of a Wildcat to make it 7-0. Purdue would tag on a field goal to make it 7-3. Jonathan Taylor would score a 51-yard touchdown for Wisconsin to make it 14-3. Purdue would answer with a touchdown to Bryson Hopkins at the beginning of the second quarter to make it 14-10. And then Purdue would score again, another Bryson Hopkins touchdown catch to make it 17-14. They'd take the lead. Wisconsin would answer with a touchdown um, to Jack Dunn to make it 21-17. He got a pass from Jack Cohen. That was a touchdown. And then they'd tag on a 62-yard field goal right at the end of the half as the clock expired to make it 24-17. to So that would be the score at halftime. And the credit for the 62-yarder goes to Zach Hintzy. And that's a, I think that's a record for Wisconsin, 62 yards. So you barely see that in the NFL these days. And then the third quarter was pretty, in the second half, it was pretty much all Wisconsin. They scored two straight touchdowns to make it 38-17. to Purdue would make it somewhat of a game again. Uh, they'd score a touchdown at the end of the third to make it 38-24. to And then Wisconsin would score one more time with five minutes to go in the game to make it 45-24, and that would be the final score. For the Badgers, Jack Cohen went 15 of 19 for 203 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. Jonathan Taylor was again their leading rusher. He had 28 carries for 222 yards, averaging just under eight yards a carry and a touchdown run. Quintez Cephas was their leading receiver. He had five receptions for 79 yards, averaging 15.8 yards a catch and a touchdown. Wisconsin ran the ball for 403 yards, and they had 606 total yards of offense. They did turn the ball over four times, however. I think they, they fumbled it quite a bit as well. They had five total fumbles, three of them lost. Or they recovered two of them themselves, but they had five fumbles and then that interception as well. So they do have to do a much better job um, with ball handling when it comes to playing Minnesota this upcoming weekend. For Purdue, Aiden O'Connell went 26 of 43 for 289 yards, two touchdown passes, and one interception. Xander Horvath was their leading rusher. He had only four carries for only 34 yards, averaging eight and a half yards a carry. Bryson Hopkins was their leading receiver. He had eight receptions for 127 yards, averaging just under 16 yards a catch and two touchdown catches. David Bell had a great day receiving well as uh, receiving wise as well. He had 12 receptions, 108 yards, averaging nine yards a catch exactly, one touchdown. Purdue ran the ball for only 50 yards, but they did have 376 total yards of offense, only one turnover. Um, but yeah, as far as this game goes, you know, Wisconsin, 
they beat, okay, they win by 21 points, so it's a good win for them, but stat-wise, they didn't look that great. They had a lot of rushing yards, which is great, but the ball handling, it was, it was, it was horrific. They fumbled the ball five times and threw an interception, so four total turnovers, and they recovered two of their own fumbles. So when they play with when they play Minnesota, they, they they have to do a much better job as far as ball handling if they want to beat Minnesota because Minnesota is going to be coming off that is going to be coming for the ball on every single handoff that Jonathan Taylor has and he's been having some fumbling issues this year so we'll see what ends up happening with that um, but yeah no it's a good win for Wisconsin it keeps their Big Ten West hopes alive and um, so the game against Minnesota this upcoming weekend is going to be for the Big Ten West, and the winner of that game will play Ohio State. College game day will be on the U of M campus for the game, so that'll be a lot of fun for both Minnesota and Wisconsin fans, and that should be a really, really nice game to watch. Uh, a lot of motivation here for Minnesota because they haven't gone to a Big Ten championship game ever, considering the first ever game was 2011, and they haven't won a Big Ten title since the 1960s, I believe. It's been that long. And, uh, yeah, but for Wisconsin, they've got some motivation for this game as well. They want to get the Axe back because of the way they were humiliated last year. They lost the Axe for the first time in, I want to say it was around 15 to 16 years. So they want revenge, obviously, and they want to go to the Big Ten Championship game as well and have another shot at Ohio State, who beat them in the Big Ten Championship game uh, two years prior to end their playoff hopes. So Wisconsin has a lot of revenge on their minds for the upcoming weeks. Big revenge for, again. Big revenge for uh, when they play Minnesota because of the axe and because of what happened last year. So they're going to have motivation for that. And the, if they win that game, they're going to have huge motivation against Ohio State considering that um, they lost the Big Ten Championship game two years back against them and the fact that they got embarrassed this earlier this year at Ohio State. So, yeah, they got a lot to think about as well. As far as Purdue, this this loss hurts for them. They are no longer bowl eligible because now they fall to 4-7. and seven. They're going to play a good Indiana team next week, so they might fall to 4-8 and eight, or they might improve to 5-7, and seven, but at the same time, it doesn't really matter. At this point, they're just playing for school pride because they're not going to go to a bowl game. It's been a disappointing year for them because of a lot of hype that was going into the program before the season started, but then the loss to Nevada and all of the injuries that they suffered, losing Elijah Sindelar, losing Rondale Moore, and, I mean, now they've lost Jack Plummer as well, so they're down to their third string. They're, they're playing their third string quarterback um, in this game, and it's just, it's not looked pretty for them. They've won more games than you'd think a Purdue game team with all of these injuries had it, that they had suffered would win, but, no, I think that, you know, I think that Jeff Brom has done a hell of a coaching job there so far. So we'll see if they can get healthy during the offseason and bounce back next year for a good season. And we'll see what ends up happening with them. But, yeah, this loss hurts for them, and we'll see what happens. But, yeah, that pretty much does it for all the games this week. And now we've got uh, my uh, conference subgroups, and I've moved some things around. For the Big Ten Elite, we've got Ohio State, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, we took Penn State out of there because they are no longer um, eligible to win their conference, to win their division. So, um, yeah, it's Ohio State, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Ohio State 11-0. They're 8-0 in conference play. Minnesota 10-1, 7-1 and and in conference play. And, Minis and Wisconsin at 9-2 and and 6-2 and in conference play. For contenders, uh, Penn State, Michigan, and Iowa. Penn State fell to the contenders thing because they're not eligible to win their division. They're 9-2 and and 6-2 and in conference play. Michigan... I really wanted to put Michigan in the elite because of how well they've been playing, but at the same time, they're not eligible to win the Big Ten East, so I kept them in the contenders. They're 9-2 and two and 6-2 six and two in conference play. Iowa, after their win, they're now 8-3, and 5-3 and three in conference play, so those are the three contenders teams. For middle of the pack, I've got Indiana at 7-4, 4-4 and four, four and four in conference play. Illinois at 6-5 and five and 4-4 four and four in conference play. Michigan State at five and six and three and five in conference play, and Nebraska at five and six and three and five in conference play. Both those teams hanging on to possibly get a bowl bid if they both win. And then the bottom of the conference teams, these are the teams that are no longer bowl eligible. We've got Purdue at four and seven, three and five in conference play. Maryland at three and eight, one and seven in conference play. Rutgers at two and nine, zero oh and eight in conference play. And then Northwestern also at 2-9 and nine and 0-8 oh and eight in conference play. So those are the subgroups I've got right now. Um, not sure how I'm going to change it up next week 
once, you know, certain teams are considered. I'll probably do whoever, I'll, I'll probably, the two elite teams I'll do will be the two teams that play in the Big Ten Championship, and then the rest of the good teams will be contenders. And then the teams that make the bowl games will be in the middle of the pack, and the teams that end up not making bowl games will all be in the bottom of the conference. So that's how I'll end up doing that. But yeah, that does it pretty much for our Week 13 recap. As always, let me know what you guys think in the comments section about the games, the teams, upcoming games, especially with Ohio State and Michigan playing this weekend. What do you guys think about Minnesota and Wisconsin as well? Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments. I will be happy to read them all. Also, if you could give this video a like, we would really appreciate that. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our main SG1 Sports channel as well. I hope you all have a great week, and we have a big weekend of rivalry Big Ten football coming up, and I'm very much looking forward to watching it all, and I'm pretty sure you are all too. Have a great week.